Uh, perfect. Lovely. Thank, thanks again for the introduction. Uh, delighted to be here. I won't uh, delay. Um, so I just want to mention at the outset, uh, as um, Roshin mentioned, my own research is supported by the Irish Research Council. The, uh, the work that I'm going to speak about today um, gives an outline of some of the findings done by myself and Damien Shields um, using the landscapes of revolution methodology. Uh, which was mainly to help inform Cork County Council in their consideration of treatment of the uh, the site around Benlabla ahead of the upcoming centenary of the death there of Michael Collins in August 1922. Um, this what I'll be talking about today. Uh, in place in 1924 is the property of the Defence Forces or the Department of Defence, but the area around it is maintained by the County Council. So hence it was they, uh, they commissioned the work that was, we, we did, uh, myself and Damien, out, out there. Um, but there's been some, uh, probably been some reporting you might have seen in recent months about plans by the Council for the location. Um, but we were glad to have a, an opportunity to, um, thanks to the uh, County Council Heritage Officer Connor Nelligan and his colleagues and members of the council itself to contribute our own knowledge and some research to that work, uh, which followed an earlier historic landscape assessment done for the council by Professor Finola O'Kane Crimmins of UCD's School of Architecture. Um, the works that that may may take place will be probably be more around the uh, monument itself and some maybe the the road around it. But rather than the monument and the memorial aspect, um, long the focus of visitors to the site. Uh, myself and Damien wanted to look at the battle or ambush zone itself um, and the surrounding battlefield landscape. Um, um, and with you to use those archaeological investigations that would be strongly informed by historical evidence using the methodologies you've been hearing described very well already by Tara and by Damien before that. Um, but hence my involvement as a historian with knowledge uh, through my own work, uh, past and present, of local knowledge, local sources, primary and secondary material relating to the uh, events at Bail and Law, um, both documentary and visual. Um, sources, many of you will know, uh, there are very, very many about what happened at Ben Leblanc, many books dedicated specifically to the subject of what happened there on this day in August 1922, but there's also a lot of uh, literature and a lot of primary source material citing the context of the surrounding guerrilla infrastructure, the safe houses, the, um, the, the arms dumps, the, um, the various personnel and uh, infrastructure that that Damien talked about uh, in Nakra, which has many similarities to the area uh, in which Bill Leblanc is located. Now, the pandemic and public travel restrictions, access to archives were all, as many of you will know, disrupted um, for reasons we won't speak about either side of Christmas 2020 in particular, when we were beginning and trying to get to the project. But um, we did, in, in, anyway, I managed two official site visits, um, first in December 2020, with uh, my colleague at UCC History, uh, Dr. John Morganovo, and then again last July in 2021, uh, when we were assisted and accompanied by local residents, Gene O'Callaghan and Tom Murray, and also a local historian, Sean Crowley. And they all added significant pieces of information uh, and aided our understanding of the, the wider picture and the local picture, and particularly some of the, the locations in the area and, and how some of them have changed over the last century, things, changes that mightn't be apparent to the modern visitor. Um, I, I was going to speak about the, defining the battlefield landscape, but I think you've, you've heard uh, much about that already by, by Damien in particular, but um, he, he defines how the location, size and extent are defined by factors, many of them there, but I would, I suppose, add to this that information and intelligence, which I suppose, I suppose maybe, maybe rather than additional factors, but they certainly contribute largely to the likes of decision making and uh, movement of people and uh, choosing locations for um, events like the ambush that took place. Uh, although ones like the one in Kilcommon, which Tara spoke about a short time ago, uh, were, were very uh, have involved heavy and long for planning. Many others, uh, just like the one at Bale Law, were decided by um, uh, fate and fortune uh, with, with not a lot of prior planning necessarily. Um, and 
some of the consequences are are related in the uh, the, the movement and the the location of different personnel throughout this particular um, uh, con- battle or conflict uh, at Bail and Blah. Um, now I'll revert to some of this towards the end, but the historical knowledge I spoke about includes the context around movements and the reason for people's presence in the area on the day itself. You know, the map here on screen uh, hopefully demonstrates why it was not at all unusual that so many West Cork IRA figures were in Bellablaw. It was mainly personnel of the uh, the West Cork IRA Brigade, even though most of the events took place slightly north of the boundary with the, the Cork um, number one mid Cork Brigade, which if my pointer is working here, I'm not sure, I'll just try it now. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, pardon my diagrams, but the um, basically anything in red is in, in more or less inside the Cork Mid Cork Brigade area. Those below it, below the line I'm showing with my pointer, comprised part of the uh, the West Cork Brigade area. But it wasn't uncommon to um, throughout the War of Independence and even before it for men and women who were active in the separatist movement uh, to move across and between those areas. To political meetings, organised labour rallies, Irish volunteer marches, and eventually to what you see on the screen, which are some known safe houses, messaging centres, arms dumps, and even medical stations um, inside the, the Mid Cork Brigade area. Um, the boundary was incidentally created a house, um, an area where Tom Barry's flying column, West Cork flying column, moved to immediately after they had uh, taken part in the Cross Barry ambush, which was much closer to Bandon. Um, and just immediately below the X in the uh, centre, which is where the ambush took place, the um, the green mark below there is Foley Safe House, which is central to the ambush at Ben Law, but it was also a, a regular um, IRA uh, Cork, West Cork Brigade area uh, officers area. But all of those all of those spaces marked in red were effectively in regular use by the West Cork Brigade, even though they were um, within the McCroom Battalion part of the Mid Cork Brigade area. So the main reason I'm pointing all this out is that to, to highlight how this was. It was, it was not unusual that there should have been so many um, men uh, of the IRA, but particularly of the West Cork Brigade, uh, in the weeks after the evacuation of Cork City and of McCroom, uh, which had been occupied by the National Army. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. Um, so, thank you. This is the um, this is so. This is the map that was produced by Sarah Neeland, Sarah Neeland, uh, for myself and Damien. Part of this work as well. Uh, this is the broader picture, zoning zoning in a little closer to Bill and the ambush area itself. Um, the um, when the Collins convoy, which had been touring the south of of Ireland, began in Cork City, way off to the uh, right, to the east. And originating that morning from McCroom, um, came in, came down through Kilmurray, which is up to the top of the uh, map, and into Bail and Blah, um, that Tuesday morning. Um, they, that's what I suppose set in set in uh, motion the events that would happen later on, and which would have significant effects on Irish history, not just the Civil War. Um, you'll know from Sarah's map as well if you see the white dots uh, around the. Um, the, the, the locations that uh, those are all uh, con- contemporary buildings that are still uh, standing today. Um, some are safe houses, some are the farm buildings and other structures that were key to movement of personnel. Some may even have taken fire during the ambush. Um, the um, I'll revert again to some of those in the end, but it was in the evening as the, the uh, National Army convoy with uh, Collins in, involved returned from the bottom of the map from the direction of Bandon north towards Ben Le Blanc. Um, most of the IRA men had, uh, who had occupied the um, the dotted line, which is an up the lane overlooking the main road, the, the brown dotted line overlooking the main road near the centre of the map. They'd been there all day, but by this stage they had begun to disperse, um, looking at the, the pink arrows. Uh, they, they were moving off in various directions, returning to safe houses, or in some cases to the, the Murray safe house. Uh, just up the hill from Bail um, uh, near the top right of the map. Um, and so these were, uh, this left meant that the upper lane in the centre was really only occupied by uh, maybe a handful of men uh, who were um, keeping safe 
or keeping an eye on the uh, their colleagues who were dismantling a um, disconnecting wires from a mine either on the main road and the barriers based on the main road near the northern end of the Amber Stone. If you can see Carroll's Bridge at the end there. So um, some men were down at Carroll's Bridge, others were at the uh, the northern end of the upper lane when the uh, when Collins and the National Army moved north into the uh, the Amber Stone there at the centre. Um, I think the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, this is a, the, the map in the center is a, is a slightly closer up version of what you've seen before. Um, effectively, so just the and the, the pictures show, I suppose, either extent of what we're calling the core amber zone here again in this map produced by Sarah. Uh, on, your, on the left hand side is Carroll's Bridge, which is at, is at the northern extreme of the amber zone. Again, some of the IRA men would have been coming, would just have come down there and were dismantling barriers on the main road alongside it. Um, and on the right is Foley's Lane. Some IRA men had already, that's looking uh, west from the main road, uh, down towards Foley's. Uh, and just in, off to the right in the center of that is the uh, is the southern end of the, the upper lane that I've talk, been talking about. Um, so, um, so apart, apart so as, as to what is there today, apart from a modern bungalow, which is located up near um, Carroll's Bridge at the northern end, this upper lane is effectively um, practically as it was a century ago, it would seem. In terms of its alignment, its width, and even in places, um, its surface. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so the, these images with pick posed by model, that being myself. Uh, thank you, Damien, for allowing me standing stand in there, uh, not knowing they'd be used in this. Um, but the, uh, the, the image on the left shows, as I've just mentioned, the upper lane, um, as it was in December 2020, at least. Um, you can see the, the main road is out of sight, but it's it's down in the valley below the, um, where, but to the left hand side. Uh, so the, uh, and you can see the road, the, the fields on the other side in between. So the main road where the National Army were, uh, are, 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 is out of sight below us. Um, where I'm standing in the, in the, in the, the side by the, the bank there gives, an, just gives an idea of, I suppose, the, um, it looks like the ditches there retain much of the original character of what they may have been like hundred years ago. And they also get this, it gives an idea of the uh, the protection that would have been available to the ambushers, uh, albeit uh, not not in position when the uh, National Army came along with those who did make it back into place or moved along the lane and um, ample enough cover, or certainly more than the uh, the National Army figures on the on the main road below them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is Long's Lane, which I'll come back to in a moment. But again, this becomes key. Um, a little later on, but again, some of the uh, the farm buildings in the horizon, which is of west uh, of the main amber zone, were were in place uh, during the day. And I'm not sure if it's some of those that are said to have taken some fire. They seem to be a distance away, but some buildings, farm buildings in the area, certainly were said to have been hit by um, by some probably the national army firing during the ambush. Um, and that's uh, again another view of Foley's Lane. Um, which uh, is uh, along which some of the the men who had already retreated were probably they probably doubled back along here to to return to the amber zone and to to to, to add to the uh, anti anti treaty RA firing on the national army below. Uh, next slide. Uh, Sorry, oh, yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, can I get the next slide, Damien, please? Thank you. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is another view. Um, bear in mind that the uh, the trees that you see in the foreground and a lot of the overgrowth probably weren't in place in 1922. So uh, it gives you a good good idea of the, I suppose the the, the advantage that those in the lane above had. Uh, looking down at the uh, the National Army forces, this is more to the southern end of where the uh, the fighting took place, and um, would would be south of the, the the existing Collins Monument, but as well as showing the dominance of the anti-treaty RA position, it's probably gives a close enough view, location where the car is and the, and the on the road there to roughly where we believe uh, Michael Collins probably was when he was uh, hit with a fatal shot. Um, if you take the next slide. Um, so this is, uh, actually go back one, please. 
yeah thanks that's the uh so this is a bend in the upper lane uh where the uh the ambushers were probably retreating where collins was said to have seen the uh um, go can go back forward again thank you where the ambush party was seen by collins turning right or um towards back up towards long's lane uh, Oh, I know there's a lot of a lot of confusion, maybe, but the um, hopefully the the circle along of the area there on the on the map uh, gives an idea of where I'm talking about, um, and the idea that Michael Collins was probably the most southerly of the National Army men at this stage in the uh, in the area to the right of the red circle uh, on the main road. Um, next, um, trying to follow it on my own notes here as well at the same time sorry apologies uh, just to confuse things further um yeah i won't bear too long on this but it, there is said to have been and it is known that some ira men uh sometime after the, sh the, the ambush had begun uh, made their way back to positions on the opposite side of the road so that's the eastern or right hand side of the main road towards the northern end there they're marked again in the um the dotted lines but the photos there give an idea of how poor or what little sight of probably any at all they had of the National Army personnel below. The, the best shots the sight they probably had was of the, the upper part of some of the vehicles in use by the National Army. But um, but we, we do know from accounts of the, the National Army participants that they were conscious of firing by uh, over their heads into that area. Um, uh, next slide. And again, that's that's a view uh, just of the same laneway, but the scene from the upper lane. Uh, I won't dwell on that too much. Uh, if you want to move along, please. Thank you. This is the um, the you, you'd almost not realise that that laneway exists. It, it's an extinguished uh, laneway up to the uh, what was then the Hennessy farmhouse, which has been replaced in the meantime. Yeah, thanks for pointing that. Yeah, so that's the the laneway we're talking about being pointed out by Damien there. Uh, it's been replaced in the meantime by a, a much more modern laneway, a laneway uh, up to the, that farmhouse, which is much closer to the monument. But other than what you can see here on the main on the main road, the the bits of rocks and the bank there, the uh, you'd hardly know that that lane, laneway exists. Um, next, uh, so the um, just bear and just calling my own version of that slide up on my screen. Uh, so yeah, so the uh, you can see here that the trees and bushes that did until recent years obscure and still in places obscure. We've just lost audio there again, Niall. I can jump in there anyway when he's coming back. Yeah. Just, just to say that it's this is one of the most notable aspects of Bale the Bluff for anyone who's visiting the location um, is that it's very difficult to grasp currently um, just how strong a position the IRA were holding on the upper lane because of the extent of the tree coverage that has come over the area, um, which was significantly different in 1922. So the upper image um, shows that, that there was an awful lot less of it there. Um, a lot of the areas that are now under tree and, and um, things like willow and that are actually um, were actually greenfield pasture um, at the time. So there was a much clearer line of sight um, during the period. Um, so I'll just, I'll talk on while Niall is coming back. Um, no, I think no. I'm back in there. Oh, you're back. Can you you're back. Yeah, go for it. Thank Al. you, Damon. Thank you, Damon. I'm more than happy for you, Dan. Only you're busy enough. I don't know. Thank you. Thanks for, yeah, I don't know. I dropped out again there, but it came back quicker than I expected. Thank you. Um, uh, so I, I took these just the other night. You, you can see, you no, know, probably a little bit later than the, the timing of the ambush. But this gives an idea of the, even though I was saying that there was a clear line of sight from the upper lane down to the main road. But when you consider that it was sometime much nearer to dusk when the events took place, again, the various con various uh, accounts are, are give it different aspects of darkness and time of evening even. But 
perhaps the, the image on the right uh, probably gives a probably a closer idea, I would think, of what it was like. Uh, so the idea that anybody could recognize who they were shooting at or have said or known that, that a particular personnel who fell or was on the road was Michael Collins or anybody else, I think is questionable. I, not that, um, but uh, it just, just just gives you an idea again. Now, and this is from the, 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 the the, the bend in the upper lane I showed you earlier, which is where we believe Michael Collins was um, was aiming his gunfire toward in the moments before he was uh, fatally wounded. Um, so um, the next slide, uh, then, please, is um, uh, yes, thank you. The um, so yeah, I mentioned yeah the. The, the this is the one on the left is a little bit south of where Collins was, and he was at the extreme south of the National Army convoy. But um, many of the accounts um, have spoken about the fact that there was a, the National Army men uh, took cover a, a, on by a mud bank on that side of the road. One National Army participant described it as a fence about a foot high. So whether it was a bank or a fence, but if you if you can imagine the um, a couple of uh, layers of re road resurfacing uh, being removed you can see that and there's a little bit of a fall in to the left hand side you know that there is there there were this whether it's the same line or similar but you know that that's the kind of bank that they were the very little covers that they had to take behind um when trying to avoid the the fire from the uh the, the anti-treaty guys who are on the um the uh the ridge above which you can see on the right hand side um Behind the uh, the uh, near, near at the very top of that image, that that line across is the um, is the is the bank uh, on the on the uh, the main roadside of the the upper lane we occupied by the IRA. Of course, they may have had uh, an advantage in line of sight down, but they were also uh, having to take a lot of cover because the National Army were, after all, armed with a uh, an armored car aiming um, machine gun fire, heavy machine gun fire at them and um they, they weren't able to just to shoot freely at the same time but they did have a better slightly better cover where they were than the men on the road below and uh, next slide please uh, thank you the um so the uh the, and the stream that you saw in the, in the more recent picture there uh has of course been uh moved over the years it's no longer running in the same course as it did on the day of the ambush the um the image here in the um the line of the stream in 1922 is shown by the dotted line which kind of followed more, much more closely the line of the road than it does today and the actual the, and as you can probably see too the road itself has obviously been widened particularly in the area again around the monument um we're lucky that the that the uh, the osi people uh were using the river because it happened to mark the townland boundary. So that's why we were like, fortunate enough. So the current route of the, the stream, which you saw in the, for, in the foreground in one of the previous images is, is marked out in blue. The left-hand side shows the upper lane occupied by the anti-treaty. And the, um, at the bottom, or sorry, at the, at the right-hand side then is, the, um, is, the, uh, is an image taken in June 1923, not in the days or weeks after the ambush because uh, as, as a historian of the area, I will tell you that it wasn't uh, an, an area where National Army were routinely walking about, never mind bringing a civilian like the uh, sister of Michael Collins. But you can see there the um, that uh, notwithstanding the placing of other reed crosses in the in the bank in the preceding 10 months before this visit of June 1923, there had been regular interference and removal of those temporary crosses usually directed into the river by anti-treaty locals. Um, so it means that there's, well, you know, the, the wooden cross that was placed here in 1923 is said to have been to mark the spot where Collins fell, but with the, with the movement uh, of any temporary crosses, even in the interim, we, it's impossible to say with any certainty that that is the precise place. It probably well is very close to it, you know, but uh, we can certainly can't say with certainty that it is the place, uh, given that there would have been no significant National Army presence there between August 1922 and June 1923 when this photo was taken. Um, and we can also tell from the map that the likelihood is that that location where the wooden cross was placed is almost certainly now uh, beneath the surface of that uh, much widened and probably multiply, uh, multiple occasions widened modern road surface. Um, the next image, please. 
Um, so again, uh, this brings me back to the significance to, of the area to the anti-treaty RA, including senior officers of the West Cork Brigade, who were predominant among those who were present on the day of the ambush. Um, and outside of the immediate ambush zone that we've seen in the earlier maps, um, other buildings marked on this contemporary map I showed you earlier, many of those largely remain intact, uh, but I'm just going to talk briefly about two of them now uh, for the remainder, and I realise I'm probably already over time with all these glitches, but if you want to take to the next slide, um, the um, the fact that much of the battlefield landscape is, is really hidden in plain sight, I think somebody else mentioned it was a terror, or Damien earlier, or maybe one of the other speakers, but um, you know, while people arriving to the area today are essentially directed to the Collins Monument, they little realise how much they're bypassing parts of the route or even following the movements of those who set and who were target of the ambush. Um, it was from Long's Pub in the picture here, now the Diamond Bar at Bain Lamar Crossroads, that the Collins convoy was directed in the morning. And from the same crossroads here, the ambushers set out to set the trap uh, for the, the, the returning convoy some hours later. Next slide here, um, we'll show the, uh, these are essentially the views that set those um, those active actions in motion because it was as Michael Collins's convoy came down the hill from Kilmory village that morning, the view on the left is what faced them coming into Bailnablaw Cross, uh, looking at what was then Longest Pub, where inside were many IRA of the IRA officers in the area for the, that is that Corp Brigade, Third Brigade meeting. Uh, nearby, um, and it was um, it was from the uh, it was from the uh, the gated the pillared gateway at the on the on behind the gable of the pub that uh, local IRA Crookstone member and gunman uh, Denny the Dane Long uh, happened to walk out as the convoy came down the hill. So he was he was he he saw them. Uh, looking in, in the direction of the, the right-hand photograph coming down the hill and move quickly to, to to move them on their way and give the directions they sought to bend them, keen not to um, have them bump into any of the senior anti-treaty IRA officers uh, who were about to converge in the area. Um, next, please. And uh, I do have only one or two more slides, two or three more slides left. Um, so um, the Diamond Bars, it is now run by the O'Kellan family, Jean and his wife Eileen, um, still stands obviously, but as well as the structures themselves, the pub, the overhead residence, the outhouses, which were likely also occupied by IRA men, uh, and some of the, but also some of the highly original features survive this doorway and very possibly the original door itself. Certainly these iron ring ties that are visible to the right of the doorway um, are contemporary to the time. Who knows even um, some of those who are there on, on um, on horseback for the meeting, uh, may, may have had their their uh, their charges tied up to the uh, tied up to these uh, tie rings outside. Um, the next slide. Um, so yeah, there, there there are many local angles on the event. Um, I actually might yeah, thank you. Uh, some of which featured in this 2019 publication by a group of local history enthusiasts. Um, from the editorial team included Connie Long, sadly no, no longer with us, but his father, Denny Jimmy Long, was another local Crookstone IRA volunteer, an IRA officer, in fact, who was who had been neutral in the Civil War, but he was a neighbour of Denny the Dane Long. They came from a little further west of Bail Um And uh, the co-editors were Mary O'Sullivan and Tom Murray, both happened to be relatives of mine, um, who, who are also still resident. Uh, Within a couple of miles radius of the crossroads of Bain Leblaw. Um, and at the bottom there is the photograph of the uh, the room with uh, in Tom Murray's uh, home place at Bain Leblaw, uh, which I presumed when I saw the book first was a photograph of an old photograph, until when Tom kindly was accompanied us on our site visit last July. We were myself and Damien were uh, a privilege to be brought inside and to see that. That wasn't a photograph of an old photograph, but this, in fact, is the parlour in the Murray farmhouse at Glownroig East, um, just not far from Bailen and Block Crossroads. The, the parlour where the uh, hastily convened um, IRA Cork Brigade meeting proceeded, or rather was adjourned to do where it was when it was decided to plan the ambush when word reached them there that morning that De Valera and company had 
packs to that area. Um, and as far as we can tell, a lot of that furniture is contemporary. The, the pictures on the wall obviously are contemporary. It's probably even the table that they sat around uh, making that decision, where they also reconvened later and where news reached some of those who took part in the ambush that it was indeed Michael Collins who had were, that well that somebody had been killed and that it was Michael Collins, um, and in fact the two ladies on the forga on the on, whose photos hang on the wall on the left is uh, is one of the daughters of the family at the time and over the fireplace that's obviously a more modern fireplace that is um, Mrs Murray Mary Ann Murray uh, formerly O'Connell who also happens to be my great grandmother. Um, so it was a bit a bit eerie walking into what is effectively a living museum. But you know, um, what I was saying earlier, this is this is just one of the uh, many many safe houses that dot this area. It's the same as the Nakraha area that Damien spoke about earlier. Um, just dotted with these places, you know, many of which are are run down or derelict. You know, others may well be uh, surviving like this. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, there is just still, of course, also much material culture. You can hit the next one as well, Damien. Uh, thanks. Um, which is associated directly with Ben Leblanc uh, in, in local and national museums. At the top is a crucifix from the room in Shanakil Hospital, where the convoy eventually returned with Michael Collins' remains that uh, was in recent enough years uh, donated to Independence Museum up the road from Ben Leblanc at Kilmurray. Uh, by the Duggan family, who in his strange coincidence um, occupied or were in Shanakil Hospital at the time and who subsequently occupied Warren's Court, uh, which was one of the big domain houses uh, in the same Kilmory parish where the, uh, the ambush took place. Collins's rosary and his great coat taken from him after the ambush are both in the National Museum of Ireland. Um, and um, Next slide, please, and my final slide. Uh, the sleeve Naman, the armoured car, which uh, I was just mentioning a moment ago, was um, uh, firing rapid machine gun fire at the uh, automatic gunfire at the, the upper lane occupied by the IRA. No, no, uh, uh, has a permanent home, I believe, in the Curran Military Museum. But if you show the map there again, uh, Damien, the um, the, it also has a further link to the immediate area around Bell and Law because um, the driver on the day in, 19, in August 1922, Josh McPeak, um, was later in November 1922, early December, uh, garrisoned with the National Army uh, in Bandon when um, he decided to change sides or he was convinced to change sides over to the anti treaty. He not only abandoned, abandoned the barracks, but he took with him the, the sleeve Naman and um, in the middle of the map there, just to the left of the word Crookstown, is um, a, a red dot, uh, which is the Galvin house House in, uh, that's the one, yeah, thank you. Uh, there's uh, at Cladaw and Crookstown, um, regularly used by RA officers. And when Josh McPeak drove the Schlievenamon out the, at the gates of the barracks and the National Army barracks in Bandon, it was to hear that it was first taken. Um, for a few hours. Uh, luckily it was removed before the National Army came looking there, um, knowing where, well where a lot of the uh, West Cork Brigade fellas hung out. A few weeks later or a few days later even, it was used uh, 10 or 15 miles west of there in a major attack on the National Army garrison at Ballymakira village outside McCroom. So again these are just, uh, I suppose the point I make is that the um, for every Long's pub and for every Murray's farmhouse with these amazing stories that the walls could tell, there are a dozen more in, in any given parish. We've just spoken about the Kilmory Parish here in which Bale and Law is located. We heard about Nakra earlier, Kilcommon. But there are a dozen more of these safe houses and important places, many of them still standing and uh, in good nick, or some that may need some preservation. But in these active areas in the War of Independence and Civil War, um, and that's why I believe we do need to, um, I suppose, to widen our definition, our view, or first of all, you know, beyond just the immediate area, as somebody else said earlier, of the of where the shooting took place. We need to widen our understanding and our definitions. Um, when we think about the uh, monuments and memorialising and recording of the landscapes of conflict, beyond where the shooting take place, 
uh, which is what and where is usually memorialized. Um, and that way we might come to think, I suppose, differently about the nature of the conflict itself and to leave a much deeper picture and understanding of it for the generations who follow when much more of these structures and of what John Borgonovo has termed the guerrilla infrastructure are at risk of, like ourselves, no longer being around. And I suppose that is what history and archaeology is all about. Um, and that's where I shall eventually leave it. Thank you very much. And thank you, Damien.